This will be even more. This is less than you. Are you guys? And this was like and the Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Geospatial Forum. I'm uh, Ross Mintermeyer, Director of the Center for Geospatial Analytics. And one of the most enjoyable and rewarding parts of my job is getting to work with and watching really our really talented uh, students actually push new research uh, boundaries in, in lots of exciting directions, maybe even setting them. And uh, today we have uh, Bashak Prachas, uh, who is a PhD student in marine, earth, and atmospheric sciences, being advised by Professor Matashova. And if uh, it's essentially you're a landmark in our geovisualization lab, <laughs> 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 always, always there, uh, doing new and ever better, exciting, exciting research. And today, Bashak is going to talk to us about how open source works for GIS in particular. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Václav Petráš, but here I'm using Bashek, so this is creating some confusion, but uh, you can get over it. So, uh, first, uh, I, will I will just talk a little bit about the motivation, why, why we are even talking about open source, why it is good, and then I will explain how open source works inside. Uh, I will go through some important terms or topics uh, which will I hope help you like to understand what it is about and then I, I will have a look at how open source software and open source approach in general uh, can help us uh, to improve academia research and education 
So, uh, some late studies they show shows us that um, uh, eighty percent of developers are using open source. So this is not a user space, but uh, what software developers are using. So eighty percent of them are using open source, and uh, we can see that. Uh, Businesses are choosing open source solutions because of quality, customizability. Uh, there is no vendor law uh, in open source, which means that you can choose your provider's uh, as you wish and you are not uh, fixed to one. Uh, there is a lot of flexibility because there is a lot of different solutions to choose from and you can go from one to the other. And there are also no license fees, but actually the cost is not the most important factor from, for most of the businesses. This is what the surveys are showing. But these were more the business uh, reasons for it. But there can be also very uh, personal uh, reasons for it. So uh, let me introduce you the case of Karen Sandler. Uh, she is currently an executive director of Software Freedom Conservancy and she is a lawyer. And she is known as Cyborg Lawyer, or this is how she uh, introduced herself. And uh, she has some heart disease and she had a peacemaker implanted some years ago. And she was a little bit edu educated in uh, software, so she knew that software every software and hardware has some bugs, some issues. So she wanted to know what are actually the issues with the software and hardware which keeps her alive. Uh, so she was trying to learn more about like the review process of this, uh, of the device she had, but there was nothing available, nothing is public. Uh, so this actually get her uh, to the open source area, and uh, she's motivated, like to that, or she thinks now that the things should be more open. So then, uh, you don't have to rely on some uh, particular company to do the review, uh, while like general public can do the review different companies, for example. Uh, then there is. Uh, uh, this is not more about motivation, but uh, I have to go through it. I would like to spend hours with this topic, but it would be probably bored. But there are uh, basically three terms we are using to talk about open source. So we are also using terms free software and libre software. And uh, this depends which things we want to emphasize. So sometimes we want to emphasize that we have the source code, but with free software, we are emphasizing that we have the freedom. Uh, and of course, different, different groups argue for different names. Uh, however, uh, there is some confusion with, uh, for example, freeware, which is uh, where the word free in freeware means really just uh, with no cost. But while in free software, it means in the first place the freedom. And you should say freedom of what? Uh, that you have freedom to modify. Yeah, so to there are, uh, this is again different definitions. So Free Software Foundation, they define, I think, four freedoms. And this is freedom to modify, freedom to redistribute, freedom to explore, and I don't know the fourth one. But open source software, Initiative, I believe that's their name, uh, they have like 10 different things which open source software must uh, meet, which are maybe more specific, but basically uh, we are achieving the same thing. While with the proprietary software, which is the opposite term to free and open source software, uh, we have like limited rights of usage. Uh, we usually buy a one license for one computer or for certain number of computers we cannot like, uh, we cannot reverse engineer the software and of course everything is harder because we don't have the source code yeah so uh, 
I will explain more of how the open source works, like how the how the right to modif how we can use the right to modify, and uh, I will explain on the case of Grass GIS. So, for those who don't know, it is a geographic information system. It has all the features you would like to have in a geographic information system, and it has some. Uh, Bonuses uh, comparing to other GIS, for example, that it runs on multiple platforms, including Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it, it is also uh, it can be also used with the connection uh, in the connection with QGIS, R, PostGIS. It can be used from Python, but it also has the graphical user interface. The interesting thing is that it is uh, that last year it celebrated 30 years of development. So it is pretty mature project. And now let's dive in into uh, the development. So it is open source, so we have the source code available. And this might be quite uh, useful sometimes. So for example, here uh, that's the uh, that's the source code of. Uh, one of Grass GIS modules, R slope aspect for computation of slope and aspect. And I was actually looking to the source code when I was doing the exam from 582 because I wanted to know how Grass actually handles the specific cases of aspect. So instead of trying and hoping that I understand, I just looked at the source code, what's there. And of course, sometimes it is hard to understand, sometimes it is quite easy you see that there are some uh, ifs and uh, assignments. You can also uh, find some other things, like how the second order derivatives are computed. And uh, you can either learn or criticize what's there. Uh, so and for this, uh, you don't need any special software. Uh, this is just a web interface for the source code repository for Grass. So you can just navigate to it. And when we are here, you can also have a look uh, what were the recent changes today. So uh, let's see. So this is the last change in the source code. And it was done eight hours ago. So. Uh, grass is 30 years old, but maybe it is just eight hours uh, old. So, uh, so I show the changes, show the changes, and then uh, uh, since you have you have the right to modify, so you can modify it yourself. But of course, no, uh, not everybody is a programmer and can modify it yourself. But in open source, you have uh, you have the op like opportunity to actually get involved in the development. So one of the things how to get involved is to request some features you are, you miss. So in this case, this was actually me, and uh, here I am requesting some uh, feature for R grow, and I like compared it to some existing modules like our buffer, which is buffer in rasters. So I wanted to have some, uh, it was growing like bigger, but I wanted to grow smaller. So I created this feature request. It's also referred as a ticket. And uh, I'm requesting uh, this new feature. Uh, then you can have a ticket, which is bug report. And this was actually Anna creating a ticket for uh, some problem with uh, cost analysis on Windows. Brandon found it. Oh, she said Brandon found it. Oh, okay. So, if you. <laughs> yeah, so everybody can get involved. Like, this is. You just need to register, and then you can report the tickets, and that's it. With this ticket, there was some discussion, quite short, actually, and uh, the ticket was closed 
uh, closed and fixed in several days by some other Grass GIS developer. So this was quite nice, and because uh, we like prov Grass provides the versions uh, like for Windows every day, like there is a new version which you can download. So like we get it next week, we have the new version and uh, we were able to uh, continue. Yeah, so this might be, uh, this, this is quite, of course, general. We are talking about grass, but uh, generally um, uh, every project requires you, if you are filling the back report, they require, requires you to say, what were you doing? Like, I was trying to do this, this, and this. Uh, I did these steps. Uh, and you have to be detailed enough so that other people are able to reproduce it. So if you can provide the data or you can reproduce it with some, Grass, for example, has some sample data which you can download. So if you can reproduce it with the sample data, that's like best for the developers because then they can use the same data and the same steps and see where they get. And if they got the same error, so we of course include the error so they can see if they are getting the same. And sometimes it is also necessary to include like what I was expecting. So sometimes it is I was expecting that this will work and it is giving me this error. But sometimes you expect different values or different uh, things or messages to show. Uh, yeah, we can, of course, if you don't know, we can talk about it uh, later. Uh, with the, uh, with the back report, what we usually do is that we are putting there uh, a number for the change. So here it was 64043. And uh, these changes are tracked again in the web interface. We usually call them commits for some reasons. And we can, in the system, we can see the changes. So I was looking at the recent change. So here, uh, we can see that there is the author of the change, uh, the description of the change, and we can see what was done in the change. So here, um, uh, this change was quite simple. It was just some wording. It is actually there is written keyword label cosmetics is the message, and the guy was just changing some uh, sentences and some letters somewhere, and it was actually for v.creating module, which is a grass add-on, which was done by Eva Stopkova, who was here recently, some of them, well, some of you met her. Okay, so uh, the c obvious question is, who can actually make these changes? So, on Wikipedia, uh, everybody can make the changes, but this wouldn't work for open source projects if like, people without any approval would make the changes. So for open source projects, only the people who get, get uh, the, the access uh, can make the changes. Uh, in GrassGIS, there is a, a project steering committee which grants access to new developers. So you have to apply, and uh, if you are, if you have some something like some history of changes you proposed and they were good, or if a lot of people know you in person as a good developer, you get the access. Otherwise, you can still make the changes for you locally, and then you can submit uh, them as a bug report or uh, or a feature request. You can like connect, add your changes to it, and somebody else will review them and commit them under your name, but uh, with his like, rights. And of course, still, even if you are not uh, really writing the changes, you can always uh, see how the changes are done. You can comment on it, uh, even if you 
cannot. There is a lot of people who like, don't program, but when they see some change, they try how it works, and they, they say, oh, this is wrong. Like, I don't like how it, this works. So you don't need any approval for this. How many developers are there? So yeah, we will we will get to it actually, or we can we can get to it now because the order is not important actually. So uh, there are some statistics uh, for how the development works. So yeah, so I'm going to the website. So there there is more methods or more websites, but the most popular one is uh, Black Duck Open Hub which was renamed from Ohloch, from those who know. Uh, uh, so we are looking at Grass project, and there is, um, uh, there is some summary created by this website. So it tells us that, that it has 71 contributors, and lines of code are maybe not really. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, interesting information in which languages it is written, so mostly written in C, but here we can see uh, more detailed graphs, so we see that there is also 17% of Python code, and uh, uh, this uh, analysis, it has some rankings that it says that the project is well-established, major code base, large development team, and stable year-over-year -year commits. So we can have a look what large development me team means. So they say that in the last year, 19 developers contributed to Grass, and it is relatively a relatively large team in the comparison to other projects which are registered on this website. And the 71, it is over the whole history. Uh, and what is important to say that it is over the history which is Direct in the versioning system, which is uh, which is done here, which is I don't know. It is like eight years or something. It would be also possible to find here like the first commit. I guess I'm not sure if 1999 is the first commit. 1999 it was put under Yes. Yeah, so this is where the versioning so control started. Yeah. So we don't have 20 years of development. So. But uh, now, uh, like these things are for some from the, for the newer projects like UGIS, you have the whole history, of course, because now we know that it is better to use these versioning systems. So every project use use it from the beginning. We did have a versioning system at Cero, mm -hmm. but it was a, an in-house versioning yeah. system. So it was managed, but at that time there was nothing like this, nothing like online versioning systems and yeah. things like that. And it wouldn't translate directly to, to CVS. So, so there is a, you know, it started to be developed in uh, 1982 or 1984, whatever you, you, whatever you consider the start. So there is some history, some uh, history captured for that time, but really the tracking it by comic by comic is 1990. Yeah, and the first versions are on magnetic tape, so... <laughs> <it's not here. laughs> Actually, yeah, some, somebody brought them at post conference, the magnetic tape with the old version of grass. <laughs> so, uh, so, if you are speaking about changes, so they can be, of course, large or small, and what can also happen is that somebody reviews the change, and then it decides that it is not really good. So. Approximately a year ago, Anna and me, we fixed some issue on Windows, so we were happily writing to mailing list. Uh, we have fixed the script handling on Microsoft Windows, blah, 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 the change set, some numbers should fix them all, and thus also should fix this issue, and so on. And the other day we got the response, no, that I have removed the hex from core.py, so whatever bugs they are, they were trying to work around, will have to be fixed where they originate. And uh, this developer reverted our changes because they were wrong. So then nothing was fixed, and he was, he's the maintainer of this part of the code, and he strongly believed that this is wrong. 
so this is like the solution we decided to go or to do was wrong so he just like reverted our changes the history is there so everybody can see which changes we did and that uh, he reverted the changes and uh, of course there is there was the message why he reverted the changes but uh, since it, it was wrong he reverted it so call it a hack yeah, oh, because yeah. because <laughs> so uh, so <laughs> I'm not sure what what <laughs> what what, what, what <laughs> hack means for you, but it is there is one thing is that it is used for ha hacking. There there are hackers, which sometimes the word refers to the same as the word crackers. So like the evil people who are trying to hack into your computer and take over it. But then the word hack. Hacker or hacking is also used in positive meaning, which just mean coding. So hack, like there is. like completely negative. It was just that there is a sort of work around. Yeah, the work around. Yeah, and the hack hack means work around. Yeah. So so there are like three three meanings. Yeah, and then there was a long discussion on the. Yeah, actually, we discovered that Gmail support like Gmail groups the conversations, right? So it, it supports only 100 messages in one conversation. Then it has to split to the another conversation. So we actually discovered this because. Now the issue is fixed, actually. So this is great. <laughs> The issue is the issue with Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the issue with Gmail is not fixed, but we haven't tried recently, fortunately. Yeah. But the discussion is there, so we can like enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and why it is there? It is there because we are communicating through mailing lists, which are public uh, and archived. So you have to, of course, uh, like apply for the membership. Uh, in the mailing list, I think it is you get it automatically, but you have to be registered to post. But everybody can see it; it is online, so you can go through the history and see all the decisions and discussions. And there is there is not only mailing list for developers, but for grass, you have also mailing list for users, and this is where most of the communication and user support and discussions uh, where all of this is happening. There are some... Sorry? I just wanted a, a comment, uh, to tell a comment about the, about the user uh, list and developer list that you need to think well before you post because it's there forever and when you search in Google for some question related to grass, it would go all the way back sometimes 10 years, 15 years so you posted something 15 years ago, it will still get to that. So you need yeah, to think yeah. about it. You were passionate oh. about something, but it was completely wrong. People will be years after that will be still pounding. You know how wrong you were about that. <laughs> yeah, so this is <laughs> oh, this is some of the people who say like how I started with open source. So they say, oh, I posted something to mailing list, and it was really really stupid what I posted there, but now it is there and I have to just flip it. And, but this is, this is like what happens. And of course, this conversation is also there, so like, everybody can see that we were doing hacks. Uh, so with, uh, with the communication, uh, there, maybe you know GIS Stack Exchange, so there, it, there is all actually even higher uh, like pressure on you before posting or on an or answering, because it has to be like properly formulated question and properly formulated answer, and it has to be some value because everything is ranked and you can get negative uh, negative points. I'm getting negative points all the time on stuck X, stuck overflow, the original programmer's one. I am really bad there. So, uh, for in comparison to Stack Exchange, mailing lists are quite easy. You have the question posted there, and nobody is ranking you if you like formulated it properly or something. And the same for the answers. Uh, then, how we uh, talk to each other is also the discussions for different uh, 
tickets, the bug reports, and feature requests. So there, uh, there are the, there are the discussions which are focused on one topic, and uh, we are trying to resolve this issue or find a way uh, how to resolve it. And time to time, there are in-person meetings, which are usually called community or code sprints, where the developers meet for a weekend or something in one room and they all code together in one room, which is quite exciting because usually they are uh, coding at different parts of the world, which sometimes leads to like better results uh, or better or fa you get to the results faster because you can uh, communicate quickly. But of course the disadvantage is that these discussions are not locked anywhere, while the mailing list ones and these ones are so. Uh, uh. So we at least try to put them on wiki or something like that. Yeah, the main point everybody the usually list puts list the list of the things what I have done today and so on. And anyway, you have to communicate with the other developers which are not on the community sprint, so then anyway, you can end up communicating with the people in the same rooms through the internet anyway. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, we looked at this. So this is uh, uh, the work I did actually during this summer uh, under Google Summer of Code. Uh, and uh, this is, I created a set of tools which can be used to uh, test uh, different, pa different parts of uh, GraphGIS. Uh, we can call it testing framework or test suite. Uh, and you can see there, uh, like the, there are some tests, like if aspect is from 0 to 360 and not something else, or something like this. And it runs different graph modules and looks to the results if they, are, if they make sense. And then it runs every day. Uh, and for every day, we have a log, like if it was successful or not. So you can see that sometimes the tests are failing, and sometimes it is better. And you can look for it is today. Yeah, OK, so this means that they are running, because we have it from today. And we can have a look, uh, let's say, uh, here, uh, r3.flow module, <laughs> which a nice author of, <laughs> and is failing, 50% success only. Uh, so it failed, and there is some, of course, like very, uh, complicated error, but with some effort, we usually are able to examine it and understand why it is failing. And then, uh, of course, there is the possibility that the test is badly written, but usually it is uh, the case. Yeah, that's uh, uh, But what's th what is the purpose is to find out if the module or the functionality is wrong which can happen when you are doing some changes and it influences something you don't expect. So then uh, it breaks and uh, the tests are here to uh, discover it. So the other day, because it runs only once a day, so you have to always wait. But then you see what happened. But since it is open source, you can actually download the tests and you can run them every day, like for you, which would mean that it would run two times a day then for the whole graph. So this would be great if you like, want to run the tests or something. On Windows. Yeah. Oh, on Windows. Yeah, I would appreciate that. And you can imagine how it is important when you have a larger number of, of uh, contributors contributing. Uh, so you can have several contributions uh, during the day. So you want to really catch the bugs uh, that somebody might have introduced before it gets established, before it gets used by, by the other modules and things like that. So that this really is very, very important for the develop, open source development where you have several groups of people who may not even communicate to uh, submitting a new code so that it's caught uh, when it is submitted can be quickly fixed. Yeah. Uh, 
And it already paid off. Like it we got several bucks thanks to this, and we got them the other day. And yes. it was not that some user w would be then saying, "Oh, this does not work." So yeah. now we really no. But we need more tests to be written. So this is also a challenge for you. Uh, this is not really related to graphs, but since it is like the latest thing which everybody is talking about, I would like to. Uh, introduce you to this. So there is Git and GitHub. Uh, so Git is a web-based hosting service. Git. Git. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the problem is that everybody confuses these two, and these. Explain the difference because I confuse it. Okay. So yeah. So GitHub is a web-based hosting service for Git repositories. Uh, so what is Git? It is a revision control system or versioning control system uh, to manage the code and changes to the code. We have seen something for GRASS. I was not really talking about which uh, software we are using for it, but it is basically the same. So developers commit the changes and it accumulates the changes and you can get the latest version of the code, or also the older, older versions of the code. And what the GitHub is doing it is doing, uh, it is a web based interface to the repository, and also like your repository is at GitHub, which is some uh, service which some company is providing. And we actually used it, oh, no, I don't want this, I want this. Uh, we used it when we were doing, uh, preparing a workshop for uh, GRASS GIS spatial temporal visualization. Uh, which we presented at Post4G like months ago, and it was uh, it was some web page. So there is some HTML, uh, and we can again browse through the source code. And this thing is again publicly available on GitHub. So uh, people don't uh, like the the resulting web page is available, but also like this uh, whole. Uh, this whole repository with all the history is available, so people can see which why we edit some things or uh, or removed some other. And there is again the list of changes, so you can see where the latest changes are. And GitHub is also doing uh, some statistics on it, so we can see some uh, some graphs and what. What is interesting graph is this one. So it accumulates from all the weeks uh, and hours where the commits, when the commits were done. So if they were done on Mondays or Tuesdays, or if it was in the evening or in the morning. So you can see that uh, we were committing mostly like in the afternoon and evening, while we are not really committing at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Although we are committing at 1 a.m. <laughs> uh, so can you click on it? Would it show like what was it? Who was it? Uh, no. It's, it's probably like privacy issue. Because, yeah, you can of course get your information just not so nicely. Uh, there is also like the development from different years, but this is the same on the previous thing I have I have shown. Okay. <laughs> Which is these things are usually used if you want to uh, find out if the people are working on the uh, on the open source project in their free time or if they are doing this as their job. Of course, it is questionable if. Uh, the fact that they are committing at midnight if it means that they are doing it is for fun or because they are paid. But sometimes people do the assumption that only at working hours should be like the most of the comments you, you do. So then if the project is done through the working hours, through the uh, work days, then you can see that the people are working on it uh, for their job. Uh, GitHub, it is not. It is really used a lot for all the small projects, like the our ones. It was one web page, but uh, 
uh, both Git and GitHub are able to handle large projects. So, for example, QGIS has its repositories on GitHub. And uh, Git can be also used uh, separately, and it was actually developed separately completely. Uh, GitHub came much later, and Git was used to uh, manage Linux, or was developed to manage Linux kernel, which is like a huge project. So they actually develop it in the purpose of like having something really fast. Uh, <laughs> so I actually made a study for it, or I had to study for this. So uh, GitHub it means just hub of Git, yeah, but Git. Uh, so the author actually of uh, Git is the same author as original author of Linux, which is Linus Torvalds, and he said for for Git he said that uh, I'm egoistic bastard. I name all the projects after myself. First Linux, now Git. Uh, and then I I knew this, but I never understand what does it mean. So, but I learned that Git is actually some word in British English slang for very bad person. <laughs> uh, and actually. Um, Linus Torvalds is actually, uh, quite interesting person because uh, he's famous for uh, being rude to other developers, uh, <laughs> and this is like a legendary. So well, he, he can it, yeah, he's. Uh, but uh, he's usually like, oh, this is example like how open source community can be rude and so on. But there was actually a study, uh, and they were like. They were web scraping the mailing lists and looking at the root words used on the mailing lists, and they find out that, uh, that the most root person on all the open source mailing lists is Linus Torvalds. So <laughs> he's not really a representative <laughs> person. And there was, then there was a huge gap. Oh, yeah, there was a huge gap. <laughs> There are lots of stories about like that for R. Yeah. yeah. Mm. In grass, we are usually trying to be like polite and nice. And if somebody is really angry about something and writes there, then usually sometime later he apologizes. <laughs> like, oh, sorry, it was really rude. Or somebody else is saying, like, oh, these rude words, we are not used to it, so don't use them. <laughs> and it was not about words, it was not about words even. It was just like wording was strong, so. They know that I am there, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm also trying not to be rude. All this, uh, but it is uh, it is hard because you have to tell people like oh this like this like what, what I was what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I was showing like the guy wrote us like oh this is completely wrong I reverted it so this means uh, but uh, some people were saying this does not mean that I hate you I just hate your code so <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to. Uh, to go to academia section, so I will try. I will try to start with an example. So one of the latest additions to GraphGIS is a temporal framework, uh, which can analyze and manage spatial temporal data in grass. And uh, the author Zaren Gebert. Uh, his group needed this for uh, some environmental modeling analysis, spatial temporal uh, things, and they needed uh, they needed these new tools, and they uh, not only created the tools and published a paper about it, but they also integrated these tools into GRASS, which means that now we all can use these tools, and we actually are, of course, using the tools already for some time, and we, what we, we were doing the workshop recently for it, and there was, of course, uh, several people on the workshop interested in it, so like it is spreading out, and uh, this is because like they shared it, and 
uh, put it to grass so that like every user of grass can now use it. So uh, this is quite nice. And uh, then there is another example of R.LI modules, which are modules for multi-scale analysis of landscape structure. And uh, this exam uh, in like this functionality was added added to Grass eight years ago, and the ori original authors are some uh, Italian researchers. Uh, I will not try to pronounce their names, but. Um, uh, they created this code and it was integrated in Grass. And uh, there was there is like eight years of changes. Like here in between, there is uh, there is eight years of changes. And the last change yesterday was 21 hours ago, so it is like two days ago. There was the recent change to this eight years old project. So uh, these researchers, which are the original authors, are not. Uh, involved in grass anymore, but uh, other people uh, are contributing now because they are using it for their work. So uh, they are able to keep it integrated into grass and um, uh, they are like improving it and uh, maintaining in the way that like of course the software is changing and the platforms are changing. So they are making all the necessary changes to make it work in every environment where grass is working. Actually, I was uh, I made some improvement in speed recently uh, when Marcus Neteller was here. He forced me to uh, look to the source code and improve it. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, the uh, this uh, I, uh, this means that then you can I rely on the algorithm that once it is done that it will not die and it is like still available, uh, which uh, leads us to like one of the challenges we are facing. Uh, in science is reproducibility, which is like quite crucial. I would maybe say that this is the most important part. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of like reasons why reproducibility is so hard. One of it is that uh, research uh, now depends on s software, either the software you are using for the uh, to conduct the research or the software, like even some script you create uh, to do your analysis. Uh, uh, but if, if we all would be using open source, uh, everybody can have the software uh, which was used for the research uh, and uh, even run the script in the software or something like this. So with open source, Everything is available, downloadable, so everybody can really reproduce the research. The other issue might be uh, even more challenging than the previous one, because the previous one, I believe that we can do this pretty easily. But the, the other issue is that the format we are using to share the results is, I wouldn't say obsolete, because it is kind of nice, but the papers are not really helpful in in the case when you really try to r reproduce something because uh, it is a prose and you have to translate the prose to the computer usually to compute something because usually the computation is the research. So, of course, if we would share the source code instead of just the paper, then we can actually reproduce the things. Quite easily then, without any effort uh, or much additional effort, and then uh, this is this is actually what I heard uh, uh, at All Things Open conference uh, that it is actually hard to report that the results that 
if you if you try to reproduce something and it does not work, it is hard to report to the community that it is not working or maybe the paper is not perfect or something. So in open source, you have seen the revert uh, and uh, heard about uh, the possibility to comment and comment pretty roughly. So in open source, these things just works like it is standard in open source. So we can maybe if we more uh, follow the open source ideas, we would we could be able to do something like this. There are also other benefits in using open source. Uh, one is that uh, when we are using open source and like promote usage of open source, then uh, students uh, can use like any open source tool they want if they know that there are some tools out there uh, because uh, they don't have to rely on the school university purchasing the license for the software but they just uh, go online and download the software and they have it so uh, and of course <laughs> if they leave the university they still have the license to use it because it is open source uh, the other thing which uh, is quite an advantageous on open source is that you can work really closely with uh, the developers of the software. So you can um, uh, you can like go to the mailing list, discuss with the developers. Hey, this is the feature I want, and you should really make it work with my big data and so on. And the uh, access to developers, this is by default. You don't have to have any special agreement to do it. Like Everybody can do it like this evening. Uh, then uh, we have seen that all the changes are tracked and all the discussions are public. So you can go back to the discussions and learn from the discussions like how the decisions were made, why we have this feature and not this feature, or why this is done in this way and not the other way. You can go to the discussions and see it. And finally, there is the big advantage of open source is that there are open source tools which enables, enable us to do all these things to like, uh, share, like the, we, have, we were looking at the kit to share the source code and of course you can use it for any things like web pages and these things. There is one more thing uh, what is uh, really important in open source. So there is a strong culture of reuse so it is standard that you take somebody's work and build upon it or completely change the work and how the change can look like I to imagine how sometimes the things are combined or reused. Uh, this was actually also on All Things Open Conference, so somebody showed this example of IKEA Frosta's tool, and if you uh, think about it, you, it actually comes in parts, so you can build them in whatever way you want. So somebody put a shelf from maybe several uh, Frosta stools, or a table, or a bike, then combining uh, the orange parts are actually printed on some 3D printer, or a slide, of course. Okay. So this is a like, completely different thing, and usually uh, you can do this with open source software, because you can take any part of the open source software and use it in some other way. You cannot do this with proprietary software because you are limited by the license. You have to use it. Sometimes you have to even use it just in the way it was designed to be used. And for sure you cannot take, take it apart and use it in some different way. Because you don't have the source code in the first place and you are not allowed in the zeros place maybe. Uh, so what we can do for open source? So I would say that uh, you can start with like, using open source software in the right way. So the right way, in my opinion, is 
just if you search some, if something does not work for you, you look for the solution, you are not finding the solution, just ask on the mailing list. Like several people per day are asking on the mailing list, so you can be just one of them. There is like no uh, problem with it, and it is not challenging, I would say. So other thing is if you uh, really find some some issue, some bug, uh, you should you should report them because uh, open source is something really what you can influence. Uh, you don't necessarily have to change it, but for sure you can influence it. If you change it in some way, and it, this does not have to be source code, you can just change the documentation. You see that the wording is bad because uh, it was not written by native speaker or just it is wrong in the factual side. You can change it and contribute contribute it back. And I think that it is, if some people just change it for themselves and then distribute it to students or something, but it is much more important to contribute it back because uh, everybody can benefit and also you don't want to uh, maintain your own version of the software. Although this is of course possible because you have freedom to do it, but I wouldn't advise this. Uh, uh, then of course if you create some uh, things like scripts, uh, some code or some tutorials which can be shared, please do. Uh, maybe somebody will use it, maybe somebody will improve it. Uh, if it is not perfect, somebody will improve it. They will not uh, argue with you that it is... Uh, if you don't... They may argue with you that it is wrong. Maybe you are wrong, but maybe maybe they are wrong. So that's like up to you to decide, but this, this is like how it works. Let, let me comment on it. Most of the open source projects like Graz and R, they have an infrastructure for people to contribute, for example, their modules. So Graz would have Graz add-ons, which don't go straight into the core code base, but they are maintained by the people who have developed them. And uh, uh, for example, I had my students to contribute an add-on. And what was interesting that a uh, similar thing happened that, uh, that Vashek was mentioning, like next day somebody was taking it and already modifying it so that it works better for, for that application. So, so there was a like, next day enhancement of that add-on. Some add-ons just sit there, nobody's using them. Sometimes you have like two or three years, nothing is happening, and then there is a big application where it is really useful, like are they break or something like that, that we are, for example, finding the uses of it for, uh, for uh, Tangium. So, so it, is, uh, it is a really great way how you can get started, just contributing the add-ons uh, without going, and there also the, those contributions have very low level uh, uh, of, uh, you know, you don't need to prove yourself how great programmer you are. You can still contribute it because it doesn't go to the core code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah. just show what you are contributing. Yes. Uh, and you, are, you were actually saying my last point. Uh, if you integrate your work into some bigger projects, like in case of Grass, you put it to Grass add-ons, uh, this ensures that it will, it will be preserved, it will be maintained in the future, uh, and this, uh, this is probably quite a uh, good feature. Uh, one bonus feature at the end, what you can get from the open source, there was no survey for it, but this is what I have heard or observed, <laughs> is that the users, users of open source software are usually more happy when they are using the software comparing to, to the users of proprietary software. So if you want to be happy, use open source. <laughs> but there is a community, so you have the sense of community when you are working in open source. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are a little bit short of on time, I actually hope that it will be shorter when I try the presentation, so I hope for more. I will jump again. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe we already have the discussion. I hope to have more discussion. Uh, so I will conclude uh, the, like what are the main points what science can gain by using open source. Uh, you have 
I was, the first part was how open source works inside, but since everything is public and everybody can join and contribute, so there is no inside and outside actually. So it is very open, it is open source. And uh, this would be great if we can have something like this in science and uh, Everything is shared and reproducible by default in open source because this is the things open source is based on and I think science should be based upon this too. And how we can make the science better uh, using open source software and approaches, uh, I would say start with yourself. Uh, add some open source tools to your workflow. Add more open source tools to your workflow if you are already using something, because this is what you can do tonight. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for maybe one question or two, and then I encourage everybody to have a little break and let, it, uh, let folks go the need to, and I'm sure Vasha could be, love to talk to you for hours now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, so you are in the first row, so you have the right, probably. <laughs> so you, you say that there's like some great things uh, about open source, but can you maybe talk about some of the, the problematic things? Problematic, yeah, there are some. Uh, so some of the problematic are that, uh, so for example in Grass, uh, we are trying to release the version 7 for more than more than one year, right? Maybe two. Uh, so, in case of Grass, there is no big company which would be uh, contributing. So, people are doing it as a part of their work, but not as the main part of the work. So, some things are very slow to do. Well, this is, for example, not the case for QGIS. But but okay. I, I, I will a little bit argue with it, so now we have the <laughs> open source discussion. That, uh, there, was, there was actually an interview with the uh, Red Hat uh, CEO about this, and he was saying essentially similar thing that things, to get things done in open source, it always goes through this very broad discussion. So things can take a long time. So you would get like the bug fixes very quickly. But then you want to do a release, and there are many people who are thinking that this needs to be done, that needs to be done. You know, or people are trying to make it better for the release, and because everybody is, uh, uh, is uh, putting in their input, the, uh, the decision making may take much longer time, because there isn't one person saying, this is how it will be done. Like sales, sales manager or something. Oh no, it would be, be like CEO, okay, or, or uh, you know, the, the chief uh, uh, technology officer or something like that, making the decision. Here the community is making the decision. And as you can probably understand, that when the community is making the decisions, you need to get to the consensus. And that can take time. But then what he was saying that if if some decision is made by consensus, then people are really committed to it. And then the implementation may be more robust. But that, that's one issue that you would have with open source. Of course, there are others. Yeah, let's take the other question as well. I was just wondering, you and I are going to start with the summer. Of course, yeah. I was just wondering, what was the perception about open source JS over there? We had one uh, uh, geospatial session there. Uh, and oh, again, we met yeah. some, we, again, we met some people who were like, oh, I need to solve these spatial things, but I don't know anything about spatial. So we told them, so they had, one guy had some particle question, so we told him like, oh, use GDAL and PDAL and you see what's there. And OSGEO is one of the largest organizations that's participating in Google Summer of Code. So I think it's about the top, top, top 10 percent. Yeah, Google is kind of into spatial things too, so they they know. So they support, they support it, and then we also have the structure that we don't have the individual projects applying for Google Summer of Code, 
but we have OSGEO as umbrella organization, so we usually get like grass usually gets three to four spots, but overall OSGEO gets about 20 or something like that. So, uh, so it is it is a pretty strong uh, it has a pretty strong visibility. So, can you comment then on this is like a, a community-based thing where people are, you know, they're giving their time. Sometimes they're working. And Google's going to probably go in there and go, hmm, these are really nice open source code. RTS, the big, they they could always obviously do the exact same thing. So can you comment about that? Because yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's why you have GTM. So uh, yeah, so there are licenses uh, which are applied to different open source projects. They are not public domain. Uh, that everybody could take it and do whatever they want. Uh, Grass has GNU GPL license, which means that uh, it is a long license, but uh, it basically means that if you take the code and you are you are you are giving the software to somebody, you have to always give the code to. And if you do modifications, you again have to share also the modifications to the source code. Uh, so, so it's a non-commercial use license. No. no, no, no. Well, what I mean is that if somebody can't take that code and so the point, the point, the point is, the point is that you, that you cannot, uh, cannot do the thing where you sell the so the, co the software and then you are the only Without seller the of the software. Uh, which then the user of the software always has, has to go to you and buy the software from you. This is called vendor lock-in, uh, where there is only one vendor which can provide the, so the code, which is happening for all the proprietary uh, software because this is how the system works, and they are selling the licenses. But in case of, uh, in case of free software or open source software, the model is different. You are not selling the licenses, but you are selling the support or the improvements or the bug fixes. Uh, like the, that you are selling the fact that you are doing this, not only because then if the bug fix is already there, once it is public, everybody can use it. Uh, but somebody has to always pay for the uh, for the license. And this is these are the models of. Uh, of open source business, which is another talk, and the yeah, licenses you know, is another talk. Life. I would if love you can maybe say. next semester yeah. we can <laughs> have a one about talk about the licenses and what the consequences are and how these licenses work with the proprietary software and stuff like it's a big issue. I get to be the bad guy. So <laughs> yeah, <I have> okay. <laughs> please feel free to, to run, but otherwise, uh, please stay and keep talking to, to Basha. And I plan to go to. Talk today. Yeah. Yeah.